Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays, a weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. 4.5 is underway, and I expect that for the next several months we will have some very particular questions leading up to Shadowbringers, so I'm uh, really looking forward to get into the Q&A now that we're kind of like in that home stretch, you know, the last several months before we actually get to the next expansion for Final Fantasy XIV. No glasses for this video, by the way. I was going to, but because I'm doing this after stream and it's like five o'clock, sun's going down, uh, <laughs> you can tell the light of the monitors is making my face a different color. It's making it blue. And so the reflection of the glasses is like, yeah, it's just gonna be distracting the whole video. Anyway, I, I did good on one of my promises from last week's episode in that I did go through the Patreon because I'm about to do the sponsor thing, and I, I didn't. There weren't too many. There weren't too many adjustments to be made, but I did actually go through it instead of saying I'm going to go through it and then not going through it. Now it's just about getting to upgrade the list below the video. I'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably not this video. Anyway, uh, thank you to our Patreon sponsors for uh, sponsoring the channel every week, like you do through hashtag demonetized. Uh, so some other things going on on YouTube, but it hasn't affected me yet. Um, I've seen it affecting some other people, but uh, stuff that isn't really relevant to talk about right now, but maybe in the near future, uh, who knows? Uh, after I thank the patrons, I have one more thing I wanna say, speaking of which. Uh, but anyway, we have, of course, our Patrons of Light. We have Kuja Cross on Genova, and we have Kernite Oni, both of which have been massive supporters of the channel, hence why they have the title, The Patron of Light. No voice changes or anything. Uh, they've got images on the screen as per usual. You guys are used to it at this point, so thank you, Kuja Cross on Genova and Kernite Oni, for supporting with being Patrons of Light. Appreciate it a lot, because it's it, it means a lot. It's a lot to me. Anyway, we also have our other sponsors, Huge List. So, be ready. We have our standard sponsors. We have Wabatalia, Alma Elma, Dark Lumina from Genova, Marianne, Ramil Gaming, Savo Empire, Mizra, Red Wings of the Baron FC from Zalera, Cyrus Oreo, Chiva, Sid Helmand of Gilgamesh, Ephra Ninja from Malboro, Cheesecat from Leviathan, Lat Lane, Weave, Astronomy of Servers, Fafarian, Rendell, Stevie Rex, and Neon. We have our elite sponsors. We have Nyark Vizsla, the Fist of Ralgar, Crystal Uzuki. I, I, I don't know why. Every time it's Krista Uzuki. I always want to say Crystal. I don't know why. Krista Uzuki, Crazed Demeanor from Midgard. Raijin Venton is from Cactar, Carol, Ray, Senchi, Shadow Link on Tonberry, Dom, Sukawake from Genova, Lamillion, I love Maker's Armor, Sarah and the Final Family, Janu Yatsu, Kifka and the Great Eagles on Exodus, Katayoshi from Kujada, Skis of Pony from Ragnarok, Renlander, West Austin, Purple Warrior, Edge of Grid Steel on Exodus, Lexi Valentine, Mentar and the Revs FC from Zodiac, Sour Cream and Charge from Genova, Renault Chakara, Goish Valfar of Siren, Phoenix Down FC on Goblin, and Siren from Zodiac. Finally, as I salivate a little bit because I just finished eating before this, um, we have our premium sponsors. We have Zeravire, Zeravire of Coral. Alchemy, Shinka, Casual Heroes, FC on Migrid's Armor, Tatach, Takan, Hyperion, Kena, Zuki of Genova, U Starlord, Coral, Sathal, Sarah Frost from Behemoth, Holy Tabasco, Crass 015, Sarah FC on Ultros, Kat Kazuma, Angus Fairground from Excalibur, Blessed of Fanfoot, Not Quarters from Excalibur, Krovus Moonscar, Private Mikey, Nine Heroes on me, Rudy Rudiger, Killer Hack of Raw Jr., Killtastic Jones. Bam! Got it done. Thank you to all our Patreon sponsors for supporting through hashtag demonetized over the last year. Now, with that, uh, there's one thing that I kind of want to get some feedback from the comment section, and the one thing that I want to give you a little bit of heads up about. Now, every week after I'm done reading the patron sponsors, we go over to the forums, we grab some questions, and we answer them there. Uh, I'll be the first to say we will probably stop using those forums because originally those forums were created for the entirety of the Dream Network, but we just don't use it very much. You know, the website isn't really going to use very much, so uh, when the website itself is available for re-upping, we probably won't. Um, since I'm the only one who uses it, the alternative is for me to do my own website, which is something I've wanted to do for a while, but I need to make sure I uh, get the right person, someone who's a little bit more creative than me. I know how to put together a web page, but with my colorblindness and lack of ability to match things and whatnot, it would look terrible. So I am going to be looking into doing that. For the meantime, when we actually are done using the forums, and I'll let you know when that actually is, we're going to go back to using the comment section on YouTube for a while until I see if I can get a website of my own made, which wouldn't be for months down the line. So just keep that in mind for the future. We will be using the YouTube comment section for our Q&A section uh, going forward. So it's going to be a lot more accessible, but it does mean not everyone's questions are probably going to be answered because it's a lot easier for people to ask questions down there. And thus more people are more likely to do it instead of having to visit like a third party website. So it does mean we probably won't be able to grab every question and it might be a little more selective about which ones we get. So that's a little bit of warning there. The other thing I want to see in the comment section is your opinions on the idea of using stories on YouTube. Now, I'm a bit of a chaotic mess uh, when it comes to like my desk space and everything. I've got papers, I've got stuff, but 
What I'm thinking about doing is cleaning this whole area up, keeping it maintained, and doing stories on YouTube, which are short videos that last about seven days. And they're more like Instagram stories, just a means through which I can communicate and uh, connect with my viewers without having to necessarily go through the creative process of making a guide or editing or whatnot. Just a quick little update video about things I'm working on, about uh, what's going on with me at any given time. So just another way for me to connect with the YouTube channel. Um, it's something I don't use on Instagram, but I'm considering using it on YouTube. So let me know what you think about that. If you just want to see those short little segments from me, just letting you know what I'm working on, progress on whatever, uh, if I decide to do those. Um, just want to know what you guys think. So with those things out of the way, finally, let's go over to the forums. We've got about 10 questions and we are not live on Twitch right now. So let's just get to the forum questions. All right, question number one. Hello, Mr. Happy. Hope you're having a good day. My question is, have you ever thought of using the duty record to make your guide videos? Since you're able to pause the fight, click on every single party member and have a different point of view and such. So you're hitting me in a very sensitive spot because I would love the idea of using the duty recorder. The problem is how many things it's available for. Uh, unfortunately, the duty recorder is available for very few things. The things I feel like I need it most for are the earlier encounters in... Uh, a raid tier, such as the first three, whereas the fourth one, I feel like I need full-blown, like, visual uh, representations via graphs and everything, which is why I generally don't do those much anymore, besides not many people actually watch the final fight in terms of uh, guide, so it generally feels like a, a less-than-needed effort when I can do more of a discussion-style video. And the other things are, like, the 24-man raids, which... I think are the ones that people need help with the most, believe it or not. I don't think as many people need help with the EX Primals. There's generally kind of a type of player that approaches EX Primals. And generally speaking, they usually do pretty okay. So uh, if there was a thing to use it for, I think it would probably be the EX Primals. But on day one, when I'm trying to get those done, I guess the duty record feature kind of slips my mind a little bit. I just don't like the feature. I think it's it just it's in its infancy and it's not growing. And that's a bit of a problem, because honestly, the only thing I really would consider using it for at this point is overhead views. Like, nothing major. I don't know. It's it's just, there's not enough to it. And I don't feel like there's any mechanics in our Extreme Primals that specifically need that kind of assistance, because our Extreme Primals are relatively straightforward. There's a split damage marker. I don't need to stop and pause for that. There's a huge dude slamming you from the north. He slams left and right. Don't really need a pause feature for that. Oh, there's snakes on the east or west side. You know, I deliberately kind of do the fight with camera angles that represent those things. And I've yet to find a spot where the duty recorder feels like it's worth using. Um, and now there's reasons other than that. Maybe like G poses and stuff. But I, I, I don't know. It just, it, I, I don't like the feature. It's just not well enough made for me to really consider diving too deep into it. Instead of just showing people gameplay and showing people how mechanics play out correctly like they do in the guides question number two hey haps how you doing you doing I i'm doing i it was kind of a rough yesterday but today has gone significantly better so thank you in your previous mondays from mr happy you mentioned protect said they should either get rid of it or change it not verbatim no i think i did say that verbatim actually <laughs> you might be paraphrasing but i think i said that verbatim uh being a white mage main that stuck out to me got me thinking since they're messing with role actions do you think it's not too far to the realm of possibility for them to return protect to white mage job specific that gives temporary aoe shields like adlo or the aspected abilities astro so i feel like that is a potential use um in pvp in particular protect does kind of uh do that but it's on a single player it's almost like uh like what benison i guess should be unless i'm forgetting something i'm pretty sure that's how protect works in pvp but uh yeah i mean there's been that consideration to give it that gameplay uh extension but to put it on like a longer cooldown so it's not like eloquium or i'm sorry it's not like sucker or deployment or uh aspected uh helios because those things are meant to be used freely whereas i feel like white mage their identity isn't supposed to be able to do that and it starts to kind of uh go down the route of homogenization a little bit however if it's something that's on like you know a 90 second cooldown for example or uh, you know a cooldown similar to shake it off or uh <clears throat> or veil for something and it's just kind of like one of those abilities i feel like it does have some merit and i think that if they're going to keep it something like that actually is the way i think it has to go it's just such an uninteresting gameplay aspect oh well i died and now the main mechanic of me dying is i have to be res and someone needs to put protect on me like if you don't die then protect is literally just like they expect us to have this and if they expect you to have it that means they could just as easily get rid of it and not use it in their calculations at all because it's not adding anything from a gameplay perspective so uh yeah i mean your idea totally works i would i would be okay with that as long as it's not like spammable like suckers or uh or aspected helios and whatnot because then i think it it takes away from the other two's identities when they go with those skills versus white mage's identity which has always been the fat 
fat heals. Question number three, A, Haps, A. If there are multiple worlds and multiple Warriors of Light, does that mean there's a possibility of also having multiple characters like Sid the Scions and such? So um, this has been touched upon a little bit in uh, the lore itself. because So we are on the Source, and the other shards, the other 13 shards, are supposed to be replicas of the Source. And whenever the Source is ushering in a Calamity, one of those shards gets destroyed and remerged with the Source. And that's what the rejoining is in an attempt to bring back Zodiac himself. Um... So, the possibility is there. I, I think that it's almost implied that if not for the specific events that take... Because here's the thing. Even though our source is... And their shards are, are replicas of our source. There's nothing to say that since their creation, events haven't gone differently. We've seen that. You know, we've seen one, sh one of those shards uh, fall to darkness and become the world of darkness. We've seen one flooded by light. And obviously that means they went through different routes. They went through different plights. They went through different struggles. And what that means is that... Uh, you know, uh, events what happened differently there. You see never any of those time traveling movies where somebody goes back in time and they change something super small, but then they come back to the present and someone hasn't been born or, you know, something's completely different. I imagine it's kind of like that. The events took place in such a in such a different way there that even if they could have potentially had a Raubon or an Amaric or any of those, there's nothing to say they did exist because the events happened so differently that the birth of these characters may never have happened. So it's def I don't see why it wouldn't be a possibility based on the description we've been given of the source of the various shards, but there's nothing to suggest they are there. So it's at, at best a theoretical at this point. Can't disprove it. It's at best, it's a theoretical. Question number four. Hey there, Xehanort1227. Hey, just pretend my channel got norted. I mean, Mr. Happy127, patch week is here and spoilers are not allowed. How I mean, if you put the spoiler tag, they're allowed, you know? Two questions for you this week. It's patch week, and without getting into actual spoilers, what were your, was your initial impression of part one patch compared to 2.5 and 3.5? So uh, I think 2.5 and 4.5 part ones were kind of similar in their scope. I think the loss of Hoon Brina and the actual defeat of an Asian back in 2.5 gives a little more weight. Um, 4.5 has a couple of key scenes that, again, I'm not going to discuss just yet that bring a lot of hype, but when it ends, it's definitely one of the least satisfying ends of a part one patch. It just kind of ends and you go, no, you can't just end it there. It leaves a lot of suspense, but it's not as satisfying of a completion. When we finished 3.5 part one and we had lost Papalimo and there was this giant Dalamood-esque moon sitting in the sky for two months, there was a lot of, not motorcycles, but one of those is about to go by as you can hear. Um, there was just so much like pressure on the situation and it it really felt like a super satisfying end of a part one 2.5 could have been its own patch almost and they they've gone back and said that literally 2.5 part one and 2.5 part two they were designed differently than 3.5 and 4.5 they were literally designed as two patches of uh updates so they didn't like naturally flow from one into the other they were just two huge events that took place back to back within the span of uh you know like eight weeks or, or nine weeks or something like that so it's really hard to judge um it's like we got an extra story patch back in 2.5 and i think up to this point 3.5 is definitely the best part one but come back to me with the same question when part two comes out and we'll we'll judge them side by side and we may do a separate video on that all together anyway two king Arts three is 20 days away what are your impressions hopes worries about the game based on everything that's been released so far i don't actually have any worries about kingdom hearts three my biggest concern Going up to it was A, they were telling us too much, uh, showing us too much in regards to the story, even after the whole leak of uh, certain key plot scenes was made public. I've managed to avoid those completely, and uh, then they decided to release more information because of the leaks. And now they're not going to patch in like the secret cutscenes or anything until a certain day, and I'm actually okay with that. I think it's a smart decision. Um, so it's not like on the internet immediately because somebody like blazed through the game and or uh, data mined it or something out of the actual file. Um, I, the only concern I had was that the gameplay was just going to be too muddled. Uh, Dream Drop Distance, I, I barely even want to play it. I haven't played it. I know all the cutscenes. I've seen all the cutscenes, but I had such a little, I have such a little urge to play it because one of the key aspects of the gameplay, Dream Eaters, it just muddles the gameplay in my opinion. Um, I feel like they did this in Chain of Memories, Dream Drop Distance, and this. That just the gameplay elements are not there. Dream Drop, if you ignore the Dream Eaters, is fine. But fine isn't good, in my opinion. Uh, I'd rather go back and play Kingdom Hearts 1, which feels relatively dated, especially compared to Kingdom Hearts 2 and Birth by Sleep and 0.2. All of which played amazingly. I was really happy with 0.2 and Birth by Sleep. 
You know, I was a little worried I wasn't going to like Birth by Sleep because of the way the combat decides to come together, but it ends up working better than I guess I otherwise would have anticipated with the equipping of the various actions and how many slots they take up. Uh, it was still, it still managed to be a very Kingdom Hearts fast-paced style game with some of my favorite boss fights right along Kingdom, right alongside Kingdom Hearts 2. So my only concern is it's going to be muddled down with too many gameplay mechanics, you know. We already know the vast majority of them, and Sora's gone from being a Keyblade Master to being a whatever the hell that key can do master. And it's just that I'm hoping that across a full gameplay, uh, a full a full playthrough of the game, that it, I don't feel that way. And that's my only concern. I have no other concerns with the game. Um, just darkness, 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 Kingdom Hearts, light, friendship, Xehanort, Kingdom Hearts. Plot done. Spoiled. Let's move on. Question number five. Hey, Habs, it's been a while since I asked a question, so I have a trophy of dodging out on Blitzball's imminent implementation. I was so convinced it was going to be Blitzball. So my question is regarding Bard and Snapshotting. I spent a good amount of time attempting to come out, convince my friend of how it works, which to my knowledge is. The moment the dot is applied, all buffs and debuffs are taken into account and will be applied to the full duration of those dots alone. And the next time that Iron Draws is used, it will no longer have the buffs debuffs added to its damage and will instead re-snapshot and take into account buffs and debuffs currently active only. His version of it is that if you start the fight with Raging Strikes and Trick Attack, the buff will stay applied till you fail to refresh the dots. Please settle this argument once and for all. And if you have any links to something where it's said, I'd appreciate that too. So this is something you could both very easily solve just by going to the Balance Discord. And I assume that even after I answer the question, you will do that. Go into the Balance Discord. Go into, I guess, any of the... You don't even have to go into the Bard section. You go into anything regarding dots and snapshotting and all that stuff. And they'll give you a very direct answer. But I'll also give you one. You were correct, and your friend was not. This is, there's a reason why, um, in a lot of bard rotations, or something that's very common to exercise, is right before Raging Strikes wears off, you know, you generally tend to clip. I don't actually, I don't know if bards still do this. They were doing this for a while with Iron Jaw, so I guess I shouldn't say they do this. Um, towards the end of your buffs, your potion, your Raging Strike, all that stuff, you'll generally Iron Jaws again to extend the duration of the dots. They're, they may not be close to falling off. But it used to be effective enough to the point where you could extend the duration of the buffed ones by, by uh, clipping them while you still had all your buffs. The reason you're doing that is because whenever you Iron Jaws, it re-snapshots whatever is currently on you. So know your buffs. Do, if you use Iron Jaws, it does not refresh all of the buffs and whatnot that were on your dots when you first applied them. It is the equivalent of a re-application, which is why when you actually cast Iron Jaws, you see both of them pop up on the screen it doesn't just say iron jaws damage it also shows you that both of them are being put back to 30 seconds it's not an extension it's a reapplication. this is true of every dot in the game that's basically the equivalent of saying that you know if i use i, I don't know i guess what are some dots that's like saying as a dragoon if i clipped chaos thrust and it's got two seconds left and i clip it with Chaos Thrust again, it's not extending Chaos Thrust, it's reapplying it. Iron Jaws does the same thing, and thus, in this discussion, you were the correct one, but if you really want to settle it, go to the big kahuna of uh, min-maxing and, uh, and theory crafting itself, the Balance Discord, put a post in there, and watch as people probably LOL at the suggestion of the second one. I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna feel real stupid if it's changed, because in all the time that I've played every character in this game, Case number one has been what it's actually been. So if something's changed on the back end and I look stupid now, then call me out on it. Because, I mean, that's it. You got you to gotta be held responsible for what you said, especially when you say it with as much confidence as I'm saying it. So there you go. I would recommend doing that. And uh, best of luck to you and your friendship with this person. Question number six. Hey there, Habs. Hope you're doing well. Hope the same for you. Uh, it's the French guy again. <laughs> The French guy. You know, I like that. That could, be your, that could just be your name. Sorry for any mistakes in my English. Uh, my questions this week, plural. Uh, what do you think about the consistency, or inconsistency, of the voice acting in 14? I mean, like, where they put it. Because, for example, it's weird in the Gimlet Dark that the NPCs with us having voice acting, but not the final boss. Or, in general, have the bosses in the Orbone Monastery be voice acted, but not a single boss in the Omega series. Uh, which is weird, since XF and Kefka have good actors. Um, and then there's also a fun fact about the translation of Ultimate Illusion from the last boss in there. However, uh, so my opinion on this is I personally don't need audio cues to tell me about a mechanic, but when they are there, I would certainly use them. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest downfalls of our rating scene. Listen, I think the mechanics are... I think we have enough of a visual cue. 
And that's the keyword visual cue. But sometimes people just prefer audio cues. They hear the same sentence over and over again and they just know. You just know that attack is coming out. Anything to correlate attack to uh, audio to attack is useful. Now, I don't know why they don't voice the, the raid series in particular with uh, the in combat. Uh, specifically, I noticed you're talking about in combat. Uh, so I guess I should specifically speak to that. Um, I don't know why they decided to do so much in regards to, you know, the Primal and Orbone and that, but they refused to do the eight man series. Um, it's weird to me because it would, it would come in handy so much for a lot of people to have audio cues in the raids themselves. Something World of Warcraft does very well. And honestly, after watching like two or three minutes of like, maybe like whatever the latest World of Warcraft world first, you know, encounter is... I hear the audio cues and I already know what mechanics are coming out. I've only been watching something I have never done before in like three minutes. So it would be really useful to some people. Maybe they'll do it one day, but if they haven't done it at this point, I'm not, I'm not too hopeful, I guess. And question number two, what are you hoping we learn from the EU fan fest? The anyone was quite surprising in the sense that they didn't give us the true direction of the expansion, announced Blue Mage, but it was a 4.5 thing, and said the complete trailer won't be revealed at EU, but we'll get some new footage. So we have to recount everything from NA. You know, you have to include trust. You have to include the announcement of the world visiting system, even though we'll be getting that again before 5.0. It is a major feature that's coming to the game. Um, and then on top of that, you have to consider the new race, which was teased. Uh, you have to consider the job teaser that we were told about. Um, you have to consider a lot of stuff outside of, you know, just Blue Mage and a couple of things here. So EU FanFest at minimum, preview of the Viera race and the male Vieras, which lore-wise we do know exist in Final Fantasy XIV. I will not say exactly where you learn it, but you do learn it in the new raid series. Um, on top of that, you have the Gunblade wielding job, uh, which we're all presuming it's the Gunblade wielding job. He said there was a pretty obvious hint at the new job in the trailer, and I don't think he meant Dragoon, Monk, Samurai, Dark Knight, or Archer. Not even Bard. Archer. Uh, so, and then there's those two things. I'd like to believe we'll hear about the 14 and 15 collaboration. We haven't heard anything about the 14 side of it yet, and if it's not here, it's gotta be in the Japanese one, but I just want to believe it's gonna be Europe. And uh, what was the other thing? I, I think they might preview the eight man raid series. Not, not like preview, preview it. Like they, they'll tell us what the overall theme is. You know, like they told us the eight man for Stormblood was going to be Omega. I think they'll preview the primals or at least one of them, uh, as well as maybe show us another beast tribe. Um, we're probably going to get to see another area or two, but not too much more than what we've already seen. Um, if it's anything, if it, if we go to any more areas other than the Ractic of Greatwood in regards to, uh, you know, the southern part of Authored, then I would presume they'd show those kind of areas in the EU uh, Fan Fest as well. We have to remember that opening keynote's like, what, an hour? Maybe a little bit more than an hour? I think maybe an hour and a half. I think it's an hour. So the amount of things they can fit in there is very limited. So uh, as much as I'm naming all these things, I expect a lot of them will just kind of be rattled off and not gone into... Uh, too deep of a detail except for the first couple of things that I named. Uh, hopefully it's a good one. It's only a few weeks away at this point, just a few days after Kingdom Hearts 3 as a matter of fact, so patiently waiting for a track to explode on. Question number seven. Hey Haps, long time watcher but first time poster here. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, hope you've had uh, enjoyed all of 4.5 content so far and you're ready for the release of the Poetics Mage. I mean, Blue Mage. Sorry I had to. Yeah, I'll agree with you. Anyway, I've got two questions, one hard, one easy. Oh, uh, you know me, I always like the hard ones, giggity. So, I I mean, you didn't say which one was which, but I guess I'll figure it out when I read it. Question number one, I know you've touched on this a few times, but I'd like to first ask uh, in, t in 2019 about your thoughts of an actual challenging four-man light party content in 14. While they were each fun, I don't mean more things like Deep Dungeon Challenge, Fuller's or Rathalos EX. To be more specific, I mean content roughly equivalent to WoW's Mythic Plus or Guild Wars 2's Fractals of the Mist. Do you think there's a place for content like that in the 14 ecosystem? So, do you think it should, could potentially serve as a viable alternative to Savage Rating for gear progression, or should it be challenge-only content? Well, First of all, ever since Savage Second Coil, um, even just throwing a title behind something I don't believe is adequate. I don't believe in challenge content only, which is why we're paying very close attention to the public dungeon in Hydados because it's already been stated it will not be a required step of your weapon that you're going to be earning from there. And it's going to be additional progress that you don't have to partake in if you don't want to. For what kind of progress, who knows? Maybe just end game in Eureka of some kind. Um, so it does have to be part of the gear progression. The, the question becomes how, um, 
Obviously, with a vertical progression game, you always have to consider what kind of rewards you're going to come out of this stuff with, and the general ecosystem for our item level progress as a whole. Now, one of the easiest options you can take in regards to rewards for challenging light party content is to increase the amount of item level that goes up in a given patch and slot it in somewhere with the new item level increases. That has its own risks and ultimately doesn't really allow the gear to scale as well. Um, and then you also have the uh, other concern of how do you make four-man content challenging? Uh, generally, the way that the Mythic Dungeons do it is you're on a tight time limit. You know, you have all these uh, you have all these affinities that can just really screw with you. Maybe a mob has like an aura that does more damage. Maybe there's more mobs. Maybe the mobs have more health. You're generally just stat buffing to the point where the mobs are all exactly the same and they're still designed the same way. They're just thro something's thrown on top of them. So you just have to approach things slightly differently and things are scaled to a higher item level. Um, no matter how you kind of do it though, you do run into the issue of when I'm BIS, I'm going to roll through these things like they're nothing, assuming that I'm in a well-organized group. Uh, I've wanted something like um, Mythic Plus, not really Fractals. I like Fractals in Guild Wars 2, but Guild Wars 2, you can make any content work in that game because the gear progression in that game is just not good in my opinion. I just don't think they do a good job of gear progression. So they can do whatever content they want, but reward structure is kind of rough for them. Also, fractal specific, um, fractal specific, uh, what's it called? Um, gearing, I suppose, you know, with the resistances. I don't know if they still do that. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. Um, one alternative to in increase in item level is, uh, something along the lines of what they did in Eureka. Uh, relax. I'll explain. Uh, Eureka fought the fact that you were max level and you were doing max level content, by giving you a separate form of progression. So you were able to use all of your skills, but you were still able to progress and earn power within this one ecosystem of the game itself. And they could technically do that with Final Fantasy XIV in other regards. For example, maybe you have your item level 400 piece and it's got those flat stats. But now as you're going through these, you know, mythic plus dungeons in Final Fantasy XIV, maybe now you're getting these augments that specifically work for uh, mythic plus style dungeons. So when the next set of mythic pluses come out, any of the hard work you've done on the previous ones will help carry you into the next ones because not only are they probably going to be item level checking you, but you're also going to have these additional effects that are for fun because that's what the content should be. I think Eureka breaking the rules in its own ecosystem showed that that's something that 14 could do to break up what kind of forms of progress you have maybe you don't need to just be level 70 and then item level and that's all your progress on your character you can have miniature ecosystems of progress i mean we already have had that with crafting and gathering have it's having its own ecosystem of progress desynthesis i mean that's how rpgs function they make you go through multiple forms of separate progression that are all attached to the same central location and that might be the result for how we go about reward structures in a new type of content like a Mythic Plus style dungeon runs. Um, I've seen someone else suggest that, uh, in fact, I've heard it, it was just yesterday. Uh, Del Monte from work to game had thought of maybe the idea of, uh, you know, every week certain dungeons are flagged as beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and you just bump the difficulty on them if they're set to advanced and you scale the rewards a little bit so any player looking for a little bit more of a challenge out of their dungeon goes there and then bam they've got a little bit more there's room for it i think there's room for it i do agree with the problem that uh healers probably become the person pressured the most unless you add really strict dps checks as well but ultimately it, there's only so much you can do mechanically with four people so you really do have to bump numbers in order to get a more viable challenge out of things like this so it's a matter of whether or not they'll do it they've said they're interested in it but they also haven't done it so what's what is what is interest without execution as for question number two in between 14 patches off i often find myself looking for oh <laughs> scrolled down by accident i often find myself looking for something new to experience there we go now it's back on the screen but at the same time want whatever it is that also scratch my final fantasy itch i know you still play 11 quite frequently but would you actually recommend it in its current live state to someone who has never played before or would you suggest playing on one of the private servers that are locked in the level 75 classic experience i never recommend the private servers for a couple reasons one no matter what anyone tells you, they are illegal, and if Square Enix wanted to shut them down, could at any moment. And for me personally, not only do I not want to get on the bad side of Square Enix for obvious reasons, you know, I work with them quite frequently, but on top of that, the idea that if any at any point they decided they cared enough to get rid of them, which they haven't up to this point, the fact that they could just wipe all my progress and any hard work I could put in, 
I'm not I'm not down. I'm not down for that. That's that's too much of a risk for me to take for me to invest in an MMO character. It's just not a fun idea. On top of that, a lot of the stuff on those servers don't break. A lot of the people who do play it are given guild by the admins. It, there's all sorts of issues with those private servers that don't really properly replicate the classic experience and just end up kind of being a place for people to go do leveling and that's it. Like the old school leveling where you swing at a mob for a minute and a half and get 300 EXP and no one cares. Um, I would personally say that Final Fantasy XI in its live state, while it does have its own share of issues because it did incorporate item level, um, I'd say at the very least, regardless of where you stand on level 75 Final Fantasy XI versus level 99 item level Final Fantasy XI, that at the very least you owe it to yourself to do Rhapsodies of Vanadil, Xylar, Chains of Promethea, the various story expansions that are in that game. So you're into the old school experience, the unvoiced experience of Final Fantasy from the first, you know, nine entries plus side games in the franchise. Um, those stories, they're very good. They're very, they're for the most part. There's a couple that kind of trail off. There's some pacing issues with a few of them, but Rhapsodies of Vanadil especially is a fantastic experience from beginning to end. Um, and that even if you're an old school 11 player who hates the current state of 11, you do owe it to yourself to at least try to get Rhapsodies of Vanadil done. After that, at the very least, 11 will keep you busy. The content in 11 is not very exciting. It never has been, to be honest. It's always been about kind of just relative relativity of the armor you earn and less about the content itself really being fun, in my opinion. Uh, and that's still kind of the case to this day, but if you're just looking for something to keep you busy and scratch a Final Fantasy itch, Final Fantasy XI does offer that experience, and you generally can log in, and no matter what, whether you have a bunch of friends online and you want to go do some group content, or you just don't have anyone online at the moment and you want to grab some NPC trusts and get something done, you can approach it anyway. It's pretty, it respects your time a lot more nowadays than it did way back when, and that's a very important distinction to make between the two. A lot of people I know bounce back and forth, between Final Fantasy 11 and 14, because sometimes they just want something that keeps them busy, you know, regardless of how fun it is, like 11, and then they want something that's more engaging and a little bit more intense, or I guess progressive, like Final Fantasy 14 is. That's the best way I could think to put it, and of course those are all just my opinions and no one has to share them, but that's how I feel about Final Fantasy 11 in its current state. Whew, I don't know which one was the easy one or the hard one still. I, I'm debating it, so it's a little, I don't know. Question number eight. Hey, Haps. Hey, how you doing? You doing all right in 2019 so far? I'm doing all right in 2019 so far. You doing? Yeah, you doing all right in the new year thus far. All right, all right, good. This is my second question. I regret to inform you. I have no bonus this time around. That's expected. That's You don't get a bonus the second time. So in exchange, here's my best regards to you and your family for a fantastic 2019. A better time than 2018 provided you all with. Dude, we could all use a better year after last year. We could all use a better year. With that... On to said question. Uh, as a person who normally plays casters primarily, I've decided to enter very unfamiliar territory and level a melee DPS. My first chosen melee job is one you're very familiar with and like to pick your brain if you don't mind. Luck has caught my interest and I'm considering on even making it my main if I actually enjoy it the way I'm thinking I will. So anyway, back to the point. What tips can you provide from a new perspective for Monk on the job itself and of course melee DPS roles in general? So Monk for me is the most fun one to level, at least throughout the 1 to 50 range, mostly because it's got enough positionals to keep you moving and otherwise the monsters aren't very interesting from one to level 1 to 50 until you get into maybe the, like the upper 30s, early 40s. So it gives you something a little bit to work towards. Um, Monk has managed to be a job that feels nearly complete throughout all the expansions, Stormblood being maybe it, where it had kind of the, the shakiest in terms of the way the job actually came together collectively. There were a few clashing ideas that still managed to work out, but definitely could have been executed on a little bit better. I'm looking at you, Tackle Master in particular. Um, and other than that, uh, one thing I'd say is there's there's three things you want to know with Monk. One, you don't need to hold on to your, your abilities to hit the positional. You want to, just like any other job, be hitting your GCD every time it's available. Your goal in between GCDs is to make sure you're on the right position or to be using things like True North, which is on a much shorter cooldown right now, in order to make sure that you're getting all the positional bonuses you can. You might think 20 potency isn't a lot, but 20 potency over a 12 minute fight, missing it multiple times, starts to be the equivalent of as if you didn't hit a button at some point. You do that with like, you know, five, six skills. It's like you basically missed pressing a button at some point in the thousands of damage that may have dealt. So it does add up pretty quick. As for the rotation itself, um, obviously Monk has multiple choices. Um, I tend to use a certain rotation when I'm streaming more specifically um, in that of the generic Fist of Fire, you know, Demolish, you know, uh, Perfect Balance, Snap Snap Dragon Twin, 
uh, snap and then going back around to demolish after that. But of course, if you're trying to be as efficient as possible, maximizing use of tornado kick is going to be the key. Now, not on and every fight, it's some, it's, it doesn't always work. Sometimes monsters are real dickheads in the first 30 seconds and don't really let you do it properly. But the idea of getting the single or even the double tornado kick rotations in is very, very latency dependent. It's, it can be very, very tough if you find that you don't have a great latency. But the payoff is, you know, on proper execution of that throughout the entire fight, hundreds of DPS ahead of the other rotations. So I'd recommend getting very comfortable with your learning process because with Monk, you're probably going to have more of a learning process than you may have anticipated with the other main melee dps not to say the other melee dps are easy but with the tornado kick iteration of monk you have so much room to gain dps but you also have so much room to lose it if you're not playing the job correctly so i'd highly recommend getting some guides in front of you learning all the most basic rotations getting comfortable with them one at a time probably start with the tornado kick one since those can be the trickiest if you start to learn the fire one first because those are far more uh apm intensive so I uh, would definitely go take a look at that, learn you know what kind of timings you're looking for, what kind of weapon skills you're looking to tornado kick on, and uh, just generally educate yourself from there. I think Monk is the most fun melee DPS that has managed to be the case even through all its ups and downs in Stormblood, even back when everyone hated it in the previous expansions. I've always loved the way the job played, and I hope that it doesn't get shit on in the next expansion. Fingers crossed. We'll just have to wait and see on that one. Question number nine. Hey there, Mr. Happy, long-time viewer, but first time posting, so I have a bonus of a QB mount to join in on the fun. I'm never going to get that fucking thing. <laughs> never going to get that fucking thing. My question for you, and I apologize if it's been asked before, do you think a system of trading in your tombstone gear for a small amount of tombstones in addition to what's already available would benefit players? For example, returning your current players that fell behind or just getting their Genesis weapon, but the clear city you extreme a day or two later and got the drop. Rather than the limited options available at the moment, the new edition will let the player who spent 1k tomes trade it in for tomes. So with that in particular, it's kind of tough because you don't trade in tomes for the weapon you trade in tomes for the item and then buy the weapon that might be a little bit tough obviously it's still hit in the same i guess general vicinity but this has been a discussion uh, and i haven't had this discussion in a long time that uh honestly i don't even see this more for newer returning players i see this more for the player who uh changes jobs in the first several weeks of a raid tier um, and the concern is how easy a system like this would be to abuse. You'd have to put a time limit on it, obviously. It need to be like within 72 hours of the purchase, uh, or with it, or before the next weekly reset. You know, you have the option to do that. Um, and I think I'm okay with the idea for the most part. I don't really see too many major abusal drawbacks, I suppose. Um, and maybe a creative use for. Uh, I don't know, maybe a creative use for, for world prog if like people have enough tombstones on week one and then they just grab those items and then if they don't clear it before the end of the week, they, I don't know, refund them so they can then use the tomes for the following. Like, that's the only abusal case that really comes to mind and it is a pretty major one, but if everyone's doing it, then it's not that much of a, I guess it's not that much of an advantage. You just have to know which item you're going to buy to try to get that extra DPS, that extra health or anything like that. So I'm okay with the idea, but I'm sure they'd have to put a lot of checks and balances on it. Um, as for this, that's in advance for your time and have fun with Blue Mage in a few days. I will, hopefully. Fingers crossed. All right, and the final question here. Hola, Captain Happy Finger Pistols. A. Now that we've probably had all the problems for Stormblood, how would you rank them? I feel like I got this question last week. I feel like I've gotten this question three weeks in a row. If not, I've just been getting it so frequently in other locations, like on the live stream or in the, the YouTube comments. Oh, you know what? I did a Reddit AMA and someone asked me the same question, I think. Or at least they asked me which one was my favorite. Um, if I had to... Oh, and I also did it, I think, on State of the Realm. I might have actually done it this week. Uh, let's see. What, what did I say? I, I can tell you right now, Lakshmi sits at the very fucking bottom, right along down there with Biako. I just, I like the aesthetics. I don't like the fights. I just don't. Um, right above that, you have, and I'm, by the way, I'm, go, I'm not going with difficulty. I'm going by, like, fun factor, aesthetics, and difficulty all in one. And that's, and, you know, Lakshmi and Biako kind of just get shoved towards the bottom. Uh, after that, you know, I had a lot of fun with Suzano. I had a lot of fun with Siryu and Suzaku. They're all kind of close. Uh, Suzaku maybe a little lower just because, again, the whole DDR phase, while it's a little hilarious, it's also very annoying, I suppose. Um, and then, you know, Suzano, as much as he's kind of a pushover, he was a lot of fun. It was, it was a very, very uh, energetic fight with a lot of trolling and a lot of really great memories for me in particular. So I'm going to go with uh, Suzaku, Suzano equals Siryu for the next three. Uh, so now we are at uh, Lakshmi... Uh, we're at Lakshmi, Biako, 
uh, Suzaku, Suzano equals Seiryu, so they're at the same point. And then Sukiyomi and, uh, Sukiyomi and Shinryu kind of just elevate a little bit. Uh, Sukiyomi is great for a story perspective, and some of the mechanics in there are good fun as well. It was more enjoyable encounter than Byako uh, and Suzaku for me, that's for certain. And then you get to Shinryu, who kind of just went, I really don't like the last phase of Shinryu. I find it to be incredibly underwhelming. But the first phase and the overall aesthetic and everything in the fight, I always love some of the most challenging fights more. And while he's not crazy challenging, he is chaotic in his own way. And for that, him and Tsukiyomi are really close to the top, but I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna edge it out to Shinryu. I will say the most fun I had this expansion was actually Seiryu, which just came out. So maybe a little bit of uh, bias, recency bias there, but I mean, Suzano, I have no recency bias towards, and I still have really fond memories of that fight as well. So uh, yeah, I mean, I hopefully, hopefully that's... Uh, that's an adequate enough explanation. I hope it was because I'm getting tired and this video is almost done. So I'm going to take the question off the screen and do the thing where I sign out and I thank everyone one more time and all that stuff. Anyway, that's going to be a wrap for this episode of Mondays with Mr. Happy. They're still there for now. So if you have questions, be sure to ask them in the forums in the description of the video. Reminder, those forums will not be there probably by this time next month. But until they're, until they're not there, we'll use them. Pretty much. I have one week. What's going to happen is I'm going to need to like pull just from like the Twitch chat or something. And uh, there's not going to be any questions on the forums. That, that'll that happen at one week. When it happens, then that's when we're going to stop using that. Maybe if you go to click the link and it says that the website doesn't exist anymore, just ask your questions in the YouTube comment section. That might be the, the best bet you possibly get. But anyway, uh, that's going to be a wrap for this week. Thank you again to our uh, Patreon sponsors, again, for combating hashtag demonetized on the channel. Thank you to everyone for asking your questions. I will see all of you next week, where I'm sure I'll be getting a ton of Blue Mage questions. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Until then, take care.